we'd come running out of the tunnel, yellow warm-ups, UCLA, we were it, we were the stuff. We were expected to win, and we expected to win. The game itself was a celebration of life. They were basketball royalty. Everybody wanted to see it. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. Such a joyful explosion of youthful enthusiasm. But it was a time of tremendous upheaval. This is the age of Nixon, Vietnam, the riots and black power. Guys were coming back in body bags. That's not acceptable, and we're not going to let that happen. We didn't want to be called boy anymore. We were a microcosm of what the real world was like. And here was this centered Midwestern guy in this sea of insanity. We had no idea what he was teaching us. We thought he was crazy. Somehow he managed to sail a ship, a championship year after year after year. How many people get to be involved in what they call a dynasty? From 1964 to 1975, the UCLA Bruins were a symbol of excellence. Their achievements on the basketball court, staggering. 10 NCAA championships in 12 years, including seven consecutive titles, four undefeated seasons, 38 straight tournament victories, and a record 88 game winning streak. In establishing perhaps the greatest sports reign of all time, UCLA transformed college basketball from a regional game into a national spectacle. It was a dynasty built on the shoulders of a passionate and idealistic group of young athletes. Part of a generation increasingly concerned with the direction of the country, as eager to be active on campus as on the court. But while the world continued to change and the rosters turned over, one element at UCLA remained constant, John Wooden, the genteel looking coach who for over four decades led the Bruins to immortality. A former All-American and English teacher, Wooden's guiding principles never strayed far from the Indiana farm where he was raised. But when the wizard arrived in Westwood in 1948, he feared his Hoosier roots would wilt in the California sun. When we drove in and got close to California, I think, why in the world did I get into this? It was rather frightening to me, to be honest. At a cocktail party, after he came, he would go and just sort of hide in a corner. He was very much ill at ease. He didn't like to mix. He didn't really understand how. I was told by Dutch Ferring, a teammate of mine at Purdue, he said, well, Johnny, you're going to find basketball a lot different. It's way down on the totem pole out here than it is back in Indiana. We shared the gymnasium with the gymnastic team. They had half the court. Basketball had the other half. And every time we'd want to play, Coach and I would get mops, and we have to mop up the floor because the gymnastic team used a lot of chalk. They called it B.O. Barn. The odors would come wafting up into the stands. And you can imagine John Wooden, who played in state high school championship games in Indiana before 18,000 people. Now he's coaching at a supposedly big-time college basketball institution, and the gym wouldn't even be suitable for a practice in Indiana high school. In addition to his loving wife, Nell, Wooden was accompanied to Los Angeles by a set of values instilled in him as a child by his unwavering and introspective father, Joshua. Coach Wooden, please. Don't whine. Don't complain, don't make excuses. Make each day your masterpiece. Drink deeply from good books. These and other codes of conduct drove Wooden as a gutty old American at Purdue and fueled his intellect as a teacher and coach in his years before landing at UCLA. Absorbing these philosophies into coaching, Wooden quickly turned UCLA into a legitimate basketball program. In his first 15 seasons, the Bruins won more than twice as many games as they did in the 15 years prior to his arrival. Something was building in Westwood, and the finishing touches came courtesy of an unlikely backcourt tandem. Gail Goodrich, a scrawny left-hander from Sun Valley, 
and Walt Hazard, a stylish playmaker from out east. Entering the 1964 season, Jack Hirsch, Keith Erickson, and center Fred Slaughter rounded out a quick but undersized team. Slaughter was UCLA's student body president and at just six foot five, the Bruins' tallest player. To compensate, assistant coach Jerry Norman helped design a smothering and revolutionary defense. The reason why we were using the full court zone press defense was we didn't have height, we had skilled players. So the game really ended up being played the way we wanted it played, not the way the other team wanted it played. When they had a zone pressing defense and only 10 seconds to cross that center line. You'd see the panic on the guards' faces. In your face! I'm a backdoor man. Break on through to the other side, light my fire, bam! The attacking team could not dribble. They had to pass. And sometimes when you have to pass, the ball sails into the 15th row. Some of them would go four, five, six, seven times where they lose possession of the ball. A lot of our offense really came out of our defense. UCLA would score baskets in bunches. They'd be 10 points ahead, and then suddenly they'd be 25 points ahead. Baskets would happen that rapidly. Dun, 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 dun. Those guys were passing and running and passing. Dun, 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 dun. And finally, there's the open man layup. Dun, 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 dun. Passing, passing, passing. Shot, Gail Goodrich. Boom, left-handed. Walt has her passer, ball handler. Just a genius, man. The finesse, the grace, the ballet. Triggered by the zone press, the Blitz and Bruins held opponents to just 70 points per game during an improbable, undefeated regular season. After winning three close games in the NCAA tournament, UCLA was up against a much larger Duke team for the national championship. Before the game, Coach Wooden asked us in the locker room, he says, now, who remembers who finished second last year? No one raised a hand. The National Collegiate Basketball Championship is on the line at Kansas City. The game offers the rare spectacle of a team with a perfect record, UCLA, the underdog because the experts... From the opening tip, Duke's size proved little match for UCLA's quickness. The unlikely hero was sophomore Kenny Washington, who came off the bench to add 26 points. The Bruins rolled to a 15-point victory to cap a perfect season on their first NCAA crown. Of course, it felt pretty good after winning our first national championship and going undefeated. But the next morning was Easter Sunday. We were waiting in front of the Mulebach Hotel, my wife and I, and a pigeon flew over and dumped right on top of my head. I thought, gee, the good Lord is telling me something there. I'm feeling too good. I must not let this go to my head. Humbled, perhaps. But John Wooden's good fortunes continued in 1965 as UCLA repeated as national champions. In the process, his electrifying team changed the basketball culture in California. To a generation of West Coast kids new to the game, basketball was UCLA. Coach Johnny Wooden guided his basketball Bruins to their second straight NCAA title with All-American Gail Goodrich igniting their attack. Number 25, All-America Gail Goodrich is playmaker. It all came together for me that day when I watched Gail Goodrich, Stumpy, race around that court. As they skin the Wolverines 91 to 80. Little Gail threw 42 points in Michigan's face and the Bruins routed them. I said to myself that day, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to play like that. I want to play for UCLA, I want to play for Johnny Wooden. I want to be a part of a championship team. The riot zone in Watts continues to be the scene of the most disastrous and the worst riot in the history of Los Angeles County. I didn't think Los Angeles had a ghetto. Just like a All the students there were driving cars and they had their own swim pools in their backyards. And when the Watts riot broke out, I was terrified. We didn't do those things in Kansas City. 30 were killed in the first six days, over 800 injured. Here for successive days and nights, mostly in the nights, the long hot summer had erupted into violence. 
Less than five months after the Bruins repeated as champs, the Watts section of Los Angeles endured the most destructive race riot the nation had ever seen. The Watts uprising arose from the growing resentment felt by America's disenfranchised black citizens. It was just one of many issues bubbling to the surface in the mid-60s as the free speech movement grew out of Berkeley and opposition to the Vietnam War developed on college campuses. They say, make love, not war. But for the most part, UCLA was shielded from the growing turmoil by an affluent surrounding community. In fact, while Watts was burning down less than 20 miles away, the newly erected 13,000-seat Pauley Pavilion was set to open on UCLA's idyllic campus. And to complement this state-of-the-art facility, the Bruins sought a state-of-the-art player. What were you major in out there? I'm going to take liberal arts, either journalism or um, music. Ferdinand Louis Alcindor, Jr. was the most dominant high school player of the era. The seven-foot sensation led Power Memorial to three consecutive New York prep titles. Though he was recruited by over 50 universities, the honor roll student chose UCLA, due in part to the school's proud lineage of African-American student athletes, beginning with Jackie Robinson. While he may have stood out in New York, at least he was home. In Westwood, Alcindor was on his own for the very first time, an 18-year-old oddity in an unfamiliar world. Unlike many stars, he is neither brash nor flashy. Instead, he is somewhat introverted, sensitive about his height, disturbed by those who poke fun at him. How's the weather up there? You know, or, uh, gee, I thought I was tall. Uh, they asked me if it's raining. But with all that, you don't mind it. Oh, I mind it very much. He experienced things that you and I could never experience, watching him walk through an airport. He'd walk very fast and rush and find the nearest seat. He'd try to sit down and, and slump so that he would be at the same height as everyone else. At times, the unwanted attention drove Alcindor further inward, giving him a reputation as being aloof. But he immediately showed he was anything but that on the court. The first major seismic event was the opening night of Pauley Pavilion when they had the annual freshman versus varsity game. Pauley Pavilion was absolutely packed. This great recruit that everybody had read about was going to play his first game. And he completely demolished them. People around us were just going, oh my god. Oh my gosh, we've got the number one ranked varsity team in the country, but they're only the second best team on the campus. After embarrassing the defending champs by 15 points, Lou Alcindor and the Brew Babes dominated their freshman foes. Alcindor led the way with 31 points per game, as the Frosh won by an average of 56 points and gave Bruin fans a glimpse of an emerging dynasty. Here he is, Lou Alcindor, seven feet one and three eighths inches, literally the biggest attraction in collegiate basketball. The 19-year-old sophomore from New York City makes his varsity debut for UCLA. The big man moves with amazing grace, and he can make almost any shot appear as easy as this. I did something that, in a way, I'm a little ashamed of. I left him in, he scored 56 points. And I did it purposely. I wanted him to throw a scare into the other teams. Alcindor scores 56 points, and it's only the beginning. He was bigger and better than everyone else. He could score 20 points before he got out of the locker room, it seemed. He was so graceful. I remember him stealing a pass, taking three steps from the top of our key to the other, threw the ball down and smashed these guys in the first row. All the players on both teams were just kind of standing there, shaking their heads. Also, the way that we played our defense, we used the sideline and the baseline and him to cut off the middle. He would go up, instead of blocking, he'd just catch it and tuck it. He would try to catch one jump shot every couple of games. Block it and laugh. Don't bring any of that weak stuff in here. You know better than that. It was very demoralizing. And that's why you saw people trying to do other things to compete with us, really be inventive on how we're going to stop this guy. 
the Washington State coach had one of the players standing on a chair trying to swat away shots to give the players a sense of what it would be like trying to drive the lane against Goliath. They had all types of strategies to stop Al Sindor, but they couldn't stop Shackelford, they couldn't stop Warren, they couldn't stop me. Lynn Shackelford could shoot 20, 25 footers and make nine out of 10 of them. And Mike Warren was so good, if they left him open, people would have to come at him. He'd just go around him because he was too quick and too good with the ball. They had an air about them that was frightening to a degree. Watching that team get off the bus, watching that team walk on the floor, they had a certain strut about them that just forced you not to like them. Their whole demeanor, you can't beat us. Superiority, winners, champions. In 1967, Junior Mike Warren and UCLA's sophomore studded lineup went undefeated to become the youngest team ever to win a college title. The team was so unstoppable that just three days after the final, the NCAA developed its own defense of Alcindor. Outlawing the dunk was a clear attack on Alcindor's dominance, but did nothing to stop the Bruins in 68. UCLA won its first 17 games of the season to run its record to 47-0 since Big Lou's arrival. The Bruins' dominance grabbed America's attention and posed the question, was UCLA unbeatable? The answer came January 20th, 1968, in what was billed the game of the century. It's the most memorable game of my broadcasting life, 50 years. It was the first time ever that a college or pro game had been televised in prime time. Along comes Eddie Einhorn, this young fellow from the East, and he had his TVS syndicated network where he did occasional regional basketball games. Dynasties promote your sport. There's the Yankees, the Cowboys, and you're lucky enough to have it. You've got to take advantage of it. As great as they were, the world was not ready unless you had a good story. Here's UCLA, the defending champion, number one. Houston, undefeated, number two. We had the David and Goliath. They had 52,000 people in the Astrodome. It was sold out. The largest paid audience to ever see basketball anywhere at any level. Where do you put the court? They decided to put the court exactly in the middle of the Astrodome. No one had a good seat. The sad thing was that Alcindor had uh, scratched his retina, I believe, the week before. All during that week, Alcindor was in the Jules Stein Eye Clinic at UCLA, sitting in a dark room. He could have had four eyes, and there's no way he could have stopped Elvin Hayes that night. And Griffin off to Hayes, who scores! Hayes again! Elvin Hayes has 31! It's like two little kids. If that person have a red popsicle, you want it. You say, give me that. That's mine. Alcindor with Spain on him. Blocked by Hayes. Listen to the Texans. Oh, and Hayes scored 39 points. I had never seen anything like it. To this day, Lewis does not like Elvin Hayes. That game was the platform from which the popularity of college basketball catapulted into the stratosphere. UCLA may have assumed the role of Goliath but it was the American public who was smitten. A record television audience tuned in, proving college basketball could sustain nationwide interest. Even in defeat, UCLA provided the NCAA with its watershed moment. Two months later, with a healthy Alcindor, UCLA avenged its loss to Houston with a resounding 32-point victory in the national semifinals en route to another blue and gold championship. The Bruins were on top of the world but it was a world increasingly unstable. Just 12 days after UCLA won its fourth title in five years, the Reverend Martin Luther King was assassinated. The civil rights movement was headed in a new direction, bringing UCLA's campus to a crossroads. The fact that they had the audacity to kill this man, we're gonna stand up, as opposed to get hit on the cheek and keep taking it, we've, we've done enough of that. Old America is beginning to meet new America. Now, I think that the real reason that they're firing me is not only because of my membership in the Communist Party, but because I have tried to involve myself as much as I could in the black liberation struggle in this country. Everybody was getting involved in writing some social, cultural, economic, and political wrongs, and then you had the Mormon civil rights movement change over into militancy. The whole movement had taken a turn to be more radical. And 
the Black Panthers had begun a concerted effort to exert their power or influence on the campus. The issue was who was going to control the, the African American Studies Center. And that was a power struggle between the Black Panthers and an organization called US. There were some very confrontational meetings in an effort to intimidate. Something happened and guns got pulled and people got shot. In broad daylight in front of 40-some witnesses, they shot John Huggins and Bunchy Carter to death. John Huggins and Bunchy Carter were members of the Black Panther Party enrolled at UCLA. Their murders inside Campbell Hall in early 1969 illustrated the mounting urgency of the civil rights movement and the vulnerability of the Westwood campus to its fallout. By this time, the struggle for black identity had already aroused the core of UCLA basketball. We were looking out for the best interests of black people as a whole in this country, you see. Uh, that involves uh, men, women, and children, you know, athletes, students, non-athletes, winos, everybody. If you're in a racist society and you're being discriminated against, it's up to you to do something for yourself. For the black athlete of the late 1960s, participating in the Olympic Games was no longer a privilege, but a question of principle. Swayed in part by a proposed boycott amongst black athletes, Lou Alcindor, Mike Warren, and Lucius Allen rejected invitations to try out for the 68 games. Their decision was both an expression of discontent and an assertion of identity. The black power movement was very important to us, particularly since we were so visible as a basketball team. We weren't the closest team off the court. We were a microcosm of what the real world was like. We'd go on the road and the black guys hang together, the white guys hang together. But we got on the floor and we were a machine. Despite the racial divides of the era, the players remained united on the court. Lou Alcindor completed his brilliant Bruin career with 37 points in the 1969 title game. UCLA's fifth championship was the third of the Alcindor era during which the team won 88 of 90 games. The three-time Collegiate Player of the Year graduated that spring with a degree in history, allowing coaches everywhere to finally exhale. We've just lost the greatest center that anybody ever seen in college basketball. And a lot of pent-up frustration with this doggone UCLA team winning year after year after year. And there was really a sense of they're going to get their comeuppance now. People were finally relieved that our dominance was soon to be coming to an end. Didn't happen. Didn't work out that way. Ha, 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 ha. We just thought that we were going to continue to win. Once you put on that UCLA uniform, you're UCLA. You're, you're heads and shoulders above everybody else. This is what we thought. You Knowing you have better history. It was just part of what we were supposed to do. Referring to the loss of Alcindor, John Wooden called his 1970 Bruins the team without. But the squad did possess a more balanced attack. Senior floor leader John Vallely teamed with sophomore Henry Bibby in the backcourt and Steve Patterson at center. Anchoring the Bruins in the frontcourt was Curtis Rowe and the irrepressible Sidney Wicks. As talented as Sidney was, he didn't always go with the game plan. Wicks was extremely undisciplined early on in his career when he came to UCLA, didn't play a lot. Did he have his moments where he tested coach? Yeah, some of those are legendary. Very vocal with Wooden, chirping all the time. Oh, yes, he did. He didn't start me. And he would say to me, Hey, I should play, I should play. Coach, you know I'm better than Curtis, and you know I'm better than Shaq. You know that. And I said, Coach, why not? I can do it. I don't think we should do it that way. Take this out, Coach. Bam. I said, Coach, well... Coach, I feel that, okay, Coach, I want to start shooting uh, from way out here. He said, no, we don't, Sidney. Why? Do you know why, Sidney? Oh, Coach, come on. <laughs> he said, no. Finally, I said, okay, Sidney, listen. And until you learn it's a team game and not a one-man game, they're always going to be ahead of you. His next two years, he was the best college forward in the country. Of course, he will tell you he was that other year, too. Wicks became a force for the Bruins during a surprising 28-win season. 
but he never lost his swagger. Early in the 1970 final, UCLA had no answer for Jacksonville's artist Gilmore, widely heralded as the next Alcindor. Trailing by nine in the first half, the two sides of Sidney Wicks aligned in perfect harmony. We didn't really have anybody to guard Artis. He was 7-2, and our center, Steve Patterson, was 6-9 on a tall day. And Sidney was the one who said, Coach, you got to let me play behind that guy. And I said, you can't guard him behind Sidney. Yes, I can. He said, I'll show you. He said, all right, Sidney, go ahead and do that. Sidney Wicks just took over the game. Sidney dominated completely shut him down, swatted the balls, threw things down in his face, and just completely intimidated him. Sidney Wicks shut down Artis Gilmore for the last 30 minutes of the game, and the Bruins won handily by 11 points, and the dynasty continued. The following year, the Bruins were as dominant as ever. In the 71 championship game, Steve Patterson scored a career-high 29 points to give UCLA its fifth straight title. In the end, the so-called team without wasn't missing a thing. I met my lead singer Jim at UCLA. Manzarek and Morrison are writing songs, smoking dope, dreaming dreams of becoming this famous rock and roll band. We were the stoners. We were the people who had taken acid and uh, smoked a little of God's good green herb to expand the consciousness, open the doors of perception. That's where the name The Doors comes from. Throughout the 60s and 70s, America's youth was empowered by a counterculture that rejected the conservative establishment. While the movement sprouted in places like Berkeley, California, it eventually blossomed in Westwood, where student inhibitions went up in smoke. UCLA was just a hotbed of energy. The freaks were coming out of the woodwork at that point. People who were straight before all of a sudden started growing their hair and decorating themselves. We sat right on the campus and smoked pot and just dared anybody to stop us, you know? <laughs> and nobody did. It was a fun time on the one level, but there were a lot of very serious issues that we were dealing with. It was our responsibility to change the world because the world needed to be changed. I'm not coming back to school until we're out of Southeast Asia. Everything was driven by the war. In uh, spring of 67, there were big rallies on campus, and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it all came to a head in May 1970. At the time, the campus was shut down after the Cambodian bombing and the Kent State shooting. that we thought about Kent State was, okay, that's it. Now you've pushed it as far as it can go. We were out there ready to just get arrested and beaten to hell. Some of us were more involved than others, but it was impossible to go to school in the 60s and 70s and not be impacted by this tremendous upheaval that was going on on college campuses. You just couldn't go to school and act like it wasn't happening. It was everywhere. So it was almost surreal dealing with the realities of an anti-war march on campus, but oh my gosh, you got to be at practice at 3 o'clock. It was like two different worlds. Felt almost schizophrenic. The guys, almost to a man, felt that the war was the wrong thing, and we were sort of being held up as all that was right with America. And it just seemed obvious to me that this was a wonderful opportunity to make it clear that the people who were against the war weren't necessarily people that you could easily categorize as hippies and commies. Who's more normal than the UCLA basketball team? We, the undersigned, are 13 UCLA students who wish to express our disapproval of the genocidal war the United States is waging in Southeast Asia. So began a letter sent to Richard Nixon by the 1970 NCAA champion UCLA Bruins. It was a bold gesture, but restrained in comparison to the unyielding social fervor of the Bruins' newest star. I remember seeing this wild-looking guy. Bill Walton, 
Uh, well, interesting. Seven feet tall and redhead, and on top of that had a bicycle that he rode everywhere that had a seat that was jacked into Bolivia. I never shot a single basket with my dad. I saw him run one time at the church picnic. But my parents were very involved in all the social issues of the day, and so they taught us to think for ourselves, question authority, and be involved. I wrecked Coach Wooden's life. He's 65 years old from Martinsville, and I'm 17 years old from San Diego, and this is the age of Nixon and Vietnam, rock and roll, and I was always arguing with them about every topic. Politics, religion, dress codes, hair link, you name it, I was on it. It crossed the line the day I got arrested at a peace rally, and Coach Wooden had to come down to bail me out of jail. May 9, 1972, kicked off three days of campus protests in response to Nixon's expansion of forces in Vietnam and Chancellor Charles Young's support of the ROTC. Joining the crowd as it marched from Royce Hall to obstruct traffic on Wilshire Boulevard was All-American Bill Walton. Walton was once again front and center two days later as tensions swelled back on campus. It was a very large demonstration that got very much out of hand. People began piling debris and wood and things at the entrances to the administration building. Overturning scooters with gasoline and things. All the guys on the team had been at the peace rally too, but I was the one that went down with the cops. They said, that big guy with the red hair and the big nose, that's the one we want. You know, when Bill was arrested, he was going by in the paddy wagon. He gave me the finger and said, fuck you, Chuck. I have since apologized profusely to Chancellor Young. I have no problem. But I was an angry young man. And Coach Wooden, he's driving me back to the dorms, and he is just in my face. He said, come on, Walt, what are you doing? You're representing UCLA. And lying down on Wilshire Boulevard, I would stop traffic. I point out to him, what if there was an ambulance rushing somebody to the hospital? Oh, I didn't think of that. I said, well, Bill, you ought to think of things like that. I'm back in his face saying, come on, coach. All my friends are over in Southeast Asia, and they're coming back in wheelchairs and body bags, and that's not acceptable, and we're not going to let that happen. And so we are back and forth in each other's face, just going at it. He finally pulls up in front of the dorm and drops me off, and he just says, I believe in the right to protest. All I say is, Stay open-minded. Don't deny others their rights just to try to exert your own particular rights. If you're in the position of leadership, you've got to stand up for the things in which you believe. Once you start giving in to them, you're lost. I just remained true to one of the things I felt. That's it. So I didn't change because I had my rule about hair and facial hair. I stuck to it. From the minute the season was over and the championship was won, we never cut our hair. The off seasons were great. You'd grow your hair, your mustache, had your sideburns. You could express yourself any way you wanted. Do your thing. On you know, tour with the Grateful Dad and cruising around the country and backpacking the John Muir Trail in the Sierras. But once we got ready to start to represent the university, we knew what we had to do. They had to get a cut. That's all there is to it. And the funniest thing was you had this rule it couldn't be any longer than two inches. And the black guys started growing naturals. It was hilarious to watch the conversations. I had a big old fro, so during the summer you would braid it and then you pick it out, it was like this. And then when I came in for practice, the coach said, I said, Wow, coach, what's wrong with hair? He said, I couldn't wait for practice to start. Coach Wooden comes in for inspection. Well, what's this? And he goes, well, what is this? It's unacceptable. I said, you can't practice today, Bill. I said, come on, Coach, what's going on here? He told me after his player of the year and the national championship team went undefeated, I didn't have the right to tell him he had to wear his hair a little shorter and couldn't wear facial hair. And I say, you're correct, Bill. I don't have that right. I just have the right to determine who's going to play, and we're going to miss you. In about 15 minutes, I'm not going to have you unless you go upstairs and get taken care of right away. He stood and looked at me. Finally, I said, 
14 minutes. I'm out the door. Get on my bike and I ride as hard and as fast as I can and I race down into Westwood and jump in the barber chair and say, just cut it all off. And give me a plastic razor and a glass of water. And I just rode right in and just dumped my bike right on the side of Polly Pavilion and went and stood in the back of the line and hoped that he wouldn't notice that I had missed the first five minutes of practice. There's no substitute for work. Leaders must be enthusiastic. You must maintain self-control. You have to have initiative. You must have team spirit. You must have poise. You must have patience. And we must have faith. Faith is believing that things are going to turn out as they should. And he never stopped with all the maxims. Be quick, but don't hurry. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Never mistake activity for achievement. There's nothing stronger than gentleness. On and on and on. What's up with this? This is kind of weird. This is a silly old man. What's he talking about? What he was talking about was his pyramid of success, a part physical, mostly mental self-help guide he developed as a teacher in 1934 and modified over three decades as a coach. Of course, to his players at UCLA, the blocks weren't the only thing square about the pyramid. In a culture that encouraged its youth to turn on, tune in, drop out, the coach's homespun slogans were hard to take seriously, not to mention his uncompromising attention to detail that always started from the ground up. I was born and raised in L.A. and played basketball in high school and was able to walk on and play in the freshman team at UCLA. My average was 0.6 a game. <laughs> When I first met him, of course, my heart was just thumping, and all the guys were waiting for Coach to come in. It's the first day of practice, and here's the Wizard of Westwood, and it's so quiet, you can hear a pin drop in there. I mean, everyone's like, yeah, he's going to give us the pill. He's going to turn the key for us. And he said, now, guys, we will begin by learning how to tie our shoes. And we're looking. Okay. <laughs> what is this? What's he talking about? I was an Indiana All-Star. We won a state championship. I had scored more field goals than Oscar Robertson in the state finals. I mean, it was like, now you're going to tell me how to put my socks on? Putting your socks on, gentlemen, there is a certain way that it has to be done. We take our socks and we gingerly over the toes. Start here on the little toes, on the little piggies. And pull them up. Pull it up real strong here. Nice and taut. Got to just pull that up there. So that there's no wrinkles on the bottom of the socks. And you get wrinkles on the bottom of the socks, you get blisters on your feet. Blisters on your feet for a basketball player, that's no good. In terms of lacing your shoe up, start at the bottom. And Lace the shoes up nice and snugly. Snug, 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 snug. There it is. I'm good to go. Put me in, coach. I'm ready. Come on. Now, this is OK sort of the first time when you're a freshman but we do the same thing every year. After a while, they realized what he was after. It was very much like the Army, wasn't it? You had to wear your uniform a certain way. Everybody's shirt had to be tucked in. Every day, there's the general inspecting you as you went out the door to go to practice. We knew that practice was going to start at 3 o'clock, and it was going to end at 5.30. If they're not there to start, they don't get to practice. And they were incredibly efficient, and they were literally taken off a 3 by 5 card. Players would refer to me as the three by five man. That whistle would blow. We went from one drill to another instantly. On the other end. Coach ran the same drills with the same emphasis every day. The drills that we ran on October the 15th, the first day of practice, we ran on the night before we played for the national championship. So that by the time the games came along, they just became memorized exhibitions of brilliance. When he wanted to correct a player, he had a very unique technique. The first thing he would do is he'd get your attention by saying your name, not necessarily really loud, but really fast. Andy! He never swore. Coach Wooden never swore. I never heard him use a swear word, ever. But he could use other words. Goodness gracious sakes alive! Goodness gracious glory sakes alive, Sydney. If he said, goodness gracious sakes alive, then you know you really better be listening. <laughs> I played basketball in Europe. I've been cussed out in many different languages. And goodness gracious sakes alive, 
is a Midwestern cuss out of the highest order. Come on, Andy, hit him. Gracious sakes alive. When you heard those words, gracious sakes alive, you knew <laughs> that all hell was coming next. When they'd hear me say, goodness gracious sakes alive, they'd say that was my profanity. <laughs> And they knew they better hop to it. Sometimes you just wish that he would be a lot quicker in how he got on you and just, you know, called you an a-hole or something and gotten it over with instead of going into these one long, flowery deals. There was a way to do everything. You could have taken UCLA people who played in 55, 65, 70, and 75, put them on the same team, and they would have been able to play with each other instantly. Sometimes we'd watch other teams practice, we'd start laughing. I mean, you'd watch this undisciplined mess, and you, you're thinking, how the heck can they be a team? I mean, this practice is a joke. In the nine years that I called their games, I never heard Coach Wooden use the word winning or losing. Never talked about, we got to win this game, it's a big game to win. Never said, we can't afford to lose here. Never used the words. The whole effort here is to find out what we're capable of. And if we can find out what that is and have peace, no conflict in our heart about our effort in this area, so we'll be happy with the results. Success is peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. No one can do more than that. He may not have stressed winning, but that's all John Wooden's teams did. And the Bill Walton-led Bruins were no different. The enigmatic redhead gave Wooden all he could handle off the court. But between the end lines, he was every other coach's problem. The first time I ever saw him run down the court and I thought, there's no way he's 6'11". He did things that I just didn't think a 6'11 man could do. The thing that was evident about Walton was the unbelievable, unfettered joy in just playing basketball. It was infectious, it was enthusiastic. There was spirit about him that was fun to watch. Here he was, the greatest player of the era. He could do anything. He reveled in that outlet pass. He could start the fast break and bolt. He would grab a rebound. He would be in the air and looking like this before his feet hit the ground and would release the ball. Boom, bingo, the ball would be gone. Almost before he got the ball off the backboard, he'd be halfway down the court. When that ball was put up to decide the fate of Western civilization, the game itself was a celebration of life. Such a joyful explosion of youthful enthusiasm, just racing up and down this court, celebrating the dream and the vision. A harmonic convergence of the highest order. Walton's superior play and zeal for the game easily rubbed off on teammates Greg Lee, Larry Farmer, and Keith Wilkes, a silky smooth sophomore from Santa Barbara. In raising UCLA's eighth championship banner, the 72 Bruins proved not all undefeated seasons were created equal. With an NCAA record 30-point average margin of victory, the Walton gang turned basketball into theater, a full-scale production with transcendent appeal. They were basketball royalty. There was no question about that. It was just a different kind of feel, a different kind of atmosphere. It was like the Yankees had come to town or the Beatles had come to town. The band would go, the cheerleaders would go. They were all gorgeous. They all looked like they'd just come off the beach. It caused quite a stir, I remember. Many of us would line up outside Pollock Pavilion, sometimes on a Thursday night. It was almost like UCLA basketball was an escape from everything else going on in the world. No matter what your political views, it was the place to go. People had their differences during the day, but when it came game time, none of that mattered. It was all UCLA basketball. It brought everyone together. It was a point of reference that everyone could agree on, whatever their differences were. 
young producer Bob Speck said, we're going to try something unique. We'll televise all the road games live back to Los Angeles, but the home games will televise on a delayed basis. I said, that'll never work. Who's going to stay up till 11 o'clock at night to see a basketball game where they're going to know the result? Bebby made 9 of 10 against Washington. He's the leading scorer for UCLA tonight. Well, it not only worked, it had higher ratings than the Tonight Show and Johnny Carson on Friday nights. And there's the All-American Bill Walton. We would go from the games back to our dorm rooms and watch them on replay. Turkovich with four fouls. You sit there with all the guys watching the game, and everybody was critical of everybody else. So if you went out there and you made a mistake, everybody's in the room, and they're just dying. And they would have a little pool to see how many times Enberg would say, oh, my. I bet we got seven oh my's out of Dick tonight. Oh my! There was a rhythm in Polly Pavilion watching a basketball game during that time. I often refer to it as the Bruin Ballet. A sense of not just excellence, but almost perfection. Bill Walton epitomized that near perfection in the 1973 championship game versus Memphis State. Walton made 21 of 22 shots, and his 44 points broke the final scoring record set by his childhood hero, Gail Goodrich. Incredibly, it was the Bruins' seventh straight title, its ninth in 10 years, and second consecutive undefeated season. It was three calendar years without a loss by the time the Bruins stretched their winning streak to an astonishing 88 games. But the 88 game streak was really remarkable in a lot of ways. We're reading about it constantly in the paper. I mean, it's just crazy. I feel a little tension in my players. They're getting it from the papers and from the media and the alumni and all that. If we're in 80 in a row now, as we got up in there, our alumni want to get 100. But if we'd have got 100, they'd still want more. With the pressure on him, it was pressure from outside to beat him. It was UCLA and then it was the rest of us. And so when you're one of the chosen ones, when you go out and play anywhere, it's their Super Bowl. Somebody's got to bring them down. That's the challenge. I wanted our kids to believe we are going to win this game on Saturday. So on Wednesday, after practice, I said, go down and practice cutting down the nets. Get it organized, because Saturday, when we win this game, there's going to be 5,000 students on the floor. You're going to tell your grandchildren someday about this moment. They're on their feet, over 11,000 here at North After leading Notre Dame by 11 points with three and a half minutes to play, the Bruins turned the ball over five times and missed their last six shots, turning Phelps' premonition into reality. The streak was gone, and with it, UCLA's air of invincibility. The loss established a dubious trend for the rest of the 1974 season, which included a tournament collapse that ended the Bruins' title streak at seven. And in recalling an era of perpetual triumph, these rare defeats cruelly linger. We lost two games to Oregon and Oregon State within 18 hours of each other. And then March 23rd, 1974, a 14-point lead with four minutes to go, a seven-point lead with 90 seconds to go in the second overtime and giving it away. I look back at my college career as one of frustration, disappointment, and ultimate embarrassment. For us to give Four games away out of our last 10 was just totally unacceptable. And I will never be able to erase the stigma and the stain from my soul about what could have been. It could have been perfect. The losses to conclude the 1974 season aside, UCLA enjoyed a decade deified by the sporting world. But even from its position atop basketball's Mount Olympus, the program was not beyond the reach of the ills that have long plagued college athletics. I still remember them all sitting here. They'd come here all the time. They came here on holidays, Christmas. I mean, it was a madhouse here. He was their father, their godfather. There was more of a street side to them. So a lot of the inner city kids felt that we could really go and talk to him about some things that you might not necessarily want to share with Coach. He was a big part of a lot of the players' lives, and I think that made him even more a part of the program, maybe more so than Coach would have liked. An overzealous fan. I, I wished he wasn't, but I, he, he worried me. I was worried all the time. I was afraid that he was going to do something that would be illegal to players. He was a guy that I always felt 
I could go and talk to. Uh, he'd get me transportation if I needed it. If I didn't have clothes, he'd figure out some way to have somebody give me some clothes. The way Sam explained it to me, uh, it was within the rules, but, I, you know, it wasn't. Sam Gilbert, or Papa G as the players affectionately called him, was a wealthy Los Angeles contractor who made no secret of his role as friend and advisor to many UCLA players. Did you ever provide players with cars or stereos or clothes or airline tickets or scalpers prices for their season basketball tickets? No, I did not. But despite the denials, he did in fact provide some Bruins with low-cost goods and services, and did so during the John Wooden era. UCLA was eventually put on probation, and Gilbert banished from the program, but only for violations committed after UCLA's illustrious run. To many, it seemed the NCAA's laissez-faire policy during the dynasty years was mirrored by the inaction of John Wooden and athletic director J.D. Morgan. While they never sought Gilbert's assistance in recruiting, their unwillingness to shield their players from him has called the sanctity of their program into question. The puzzle of Papa G remains the elephant in the UCLA trophy room. There's always been and still is that undercurrent of what Sam Gilbert was doing at that time. How much it really impacts the success of UCLA basketball, I'm still not 100% certain. I think the general consensus of opinion is that every school in the conference will be stronger than they were a year ago, with the exception of UCLA. And, of course, we can't be expected to with the loss of an all-time superstar like Walton and, of course, a, a real star in Keith Wilk. But, uh, nevertheless, we expect to be in contention all the way. The summer of 1974 witnessed Bill Walton's graduation and Richard Nixon's resignation. The war in Vietnam was over as was UCLA's seven-year reign as defending champs. The 1975 season marked a new day indeed. I remember as a high school kid really being eager to get on the college scene so I could shut down something, burn something down. Let's go shut down Westwood Boulevard like Bill Walton and the guys used to do. And then when I got to UCLA, the war in Vietnam was de-escalating at that point, and I was kind of like the rebel without a cause. I mean, we were almost apolitical at that time. That team was a real hard hat, bologna sandwich, blue collar type of a team. I give a lot of credit to Dave Myers, who's our senior leader. Just scrappy, dive on the floor, floor burns, just do whatever it takes. Other than returning senior Dave Myers, John Wooden wasn't sure what he had to work with. But guards Pete Turgovich and Andre McCarter, center Ralph Drollinger, and forward Marcus Johnson played with a resilient style that offset the team's inexperience. The final scores were closer than in previous years, but the Bruins found themselves in familiar territory, playing in the 1975 Final Four. In the semis versus Louisville, Richard Washington's jumper with three seconds remaining in overtime put UCLA into the finals. But the night took an even more dramatic turn. And I want to tell you this, young man, regardless of how the game comes out Monday, I want you to know I've never had a team whom I've been more proud. You haven't caused me a problem on or off the court this whole season, and that's a pretty nice thing to say about the last team you'll ever teach. And they were just quiet. Nobody knew it. My assistant didn't know it. I didn't know it myself just a few seconds before. The game against Kentucky would be his final game as a coach. He was retiring, win or lose after that game. Look, man, there's no way we're going to let Coach go out and not win a national championship. Coach, we're not going out and losing a championship game. Come on, you got to be crazy. You know, it's not even fathomable to think that. It was a game in which things were almost surreal. You could almost see the players playing above the floor, almost like they were running on air. It was like they were actually moving in space, and you just can't not be absorbed in what you're seeing. More than history, it was something with the ages. It is one of those fantastic moments in sports history when UCLA's John Wooden, in his final coaching game at UCLA, gets the 
It's a team that responded magnificently and goes out a winner. The 10th NCAA title for UCLA. The final star. Ten is such a perfect number. It's such a nice, round, even number. And it meant a lot, and it still does, to be able to send him out like he's supposed to be sent out. During UCLA's decade of dominance, the Bruins won 335 games. They lost just 22. But for the players, the true essence of their achievement fell into view only years later as time transformed youth into wisdom. Each title endures as a moment in their coming of age, a living, breathing legacy of a teacher, his pupils, and the era in which they stood as the class of college basketball. Now, here come the Bruins, led by Walt Hazard, carrying the trophy implementing a new... It's one of those things where you're not able to grasp it because it was so big. That's a lot right here, a lot of heart, a lot of courage. They were always on top, and getting to the top is hard. Staying on the top is almost impossible. People said, well, he won three championships with Alcindor, two with Walt. Well, yeah, that means he won five more without either of those great players. What UCLA accomplished was never going to be equaled. It's never going to happen. It was just history in the making. They don't talk about me with the 76ers and winning that championship when I was with the Knicks. They talk about me being with UCLA. You're talking about 35 years ago. When you're part of something like that, it changes your life forever. It was the fans. It was the players that we had. It was the times. What it really was, was John Wooden. Because this is really someone who is an intergalactic treasure. This is my little grandson. was something kind of subversive about how he taught us. And we didn't get most of it when we were there. It was flying right by us, over our head, past our ears, and under us. Only later did I realize that what he was teaching us on a basketball court really start to apply that in everyday life. I feel the same way. Everything he said on the court has helped us tremendously. The influence it has on you in making certain decisions, how you carry it with you going forward, how you fall back on it when you get knocked on your ass. And as our children have chased down their dreams in life, whatever it is, I'm always barking out to them, be quick, but don't hurry. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Happiness begins when selfishness ends. I'm writing on their lunch bags, never mistake an activity for achievement. The worst things you can do for the ones you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. We love Coach Wooden. Because he really did give us everything. He taught us how to learn, he taught us how to think, he taught us how to dream, he taught us how to be part of a team. He never told us the answers. He just told us how to get there.
This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.